Um, <laughs> there, I mean, there's you know, the night I got shot. Uh, I, I, I shouldn't, I shouldn't have walked out of that one alive. Um, we, uh, it's man, it's that, that, that one's a long story. I'll, I'll try to give you a, a oh, dig in, I, I, dig in. And, um, I'll try to give you a, and, uh, and again, it's, it's a unit story. So I'll, I'll make it, um, I'll make it un unfortunately somewhat vague, That's but fine. the, but the, but the backside of the story still remains is we were going after a very, very high target individual. And, um, the, the way we wanted to go after him, uh, we were told that we were going to go tonight. And for these reasons, and, uh, we basically told him, Hey, there's, there's a smarter way to do business. Uh, you know, we, um, trust us. This is, this is what we do. We'll hit them tomorrow. Uh, and under the circumstances that, 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 that we want. Um, and they basically said, uh, that's, that's fine. Then, then we'll send the Rangers. <laughs> and, uh, and we basically got together and we're like, people are going to die tonight if, if the Rangers go. And that's not knocking the Rangers. The Rangers are great dudes. Um, but at the end of the day, they're, 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 they're not us. And this, you know, you, uh, you know, when you do this, this job long enough, you, you know, when you get a, a warning order, if this is going to be, you know, one of those missions or not, and this was just going to be one of those missions, everything was difficult about the target. There was no good way to get in. There was a lot of them. It was going to be uh, a nasty one. And, and it was, and, uh, so we basically took it to a vote. And we're like, hey, you know, do, do you know, do, do we, are, are we going to go tonight, or you know, are we going to let the Rangers go go take this one? And uh, every every person in that room raised their hand. Um, and again, it wasn't for glory purposes. Like we we truly believe we were saving guys' lives that night by by uh, us taking a bad mission that we normally would not have have taken. So uh, we uh, we take off on uh, on, on this target. And, um, just everything was difficult about it. Um, everyone loves, you know, uh, the movie when guys are fast roping on the target, you don't want to fast rope on the target. <laughs> Let me tell you, you don't want to be 30 feet off the ground on the noisiest thing in the Valley dangling on a rope or waiting for your turn to dangle on a rope. It is not a good feeling. It's a good way to get a helicopter shot down. It's a good way to get guys shot before they even get a chance to fight. Um, so even though it's, there are times it's the right call, it's not, uh, it's, it's rarely is it option a, um, we, we couldn't take that. And so unfortunately this, this target was right in the middle of the village. So really the only good way to do it was to land outside the village and run all the way, you know, into target, which unfortunately is going to take some time and, you know, the the surprise is, is probably going to be given. It's going to be uh, given up. So, uh, that's what we did. We, we took that option. And by the time we got to target, there wasn't a, a single person in the, uh, inside the, inside the target house, but there was a fresh fire going. There's a lot of, uh, Taliban, um, uh, paper, uh, paper trail. So we knew someone was there. We knew the Intel was right that we knew they were there that night that they just heard the helicopters and took off. Um, so we had a, most of the assault team had a follow on target. They were going to go hit. We, we had reason to believe uh, a house not too far away was a family member's house and they were going to go do a follow on target. There seemed like a reasonable place for him to go. Um, I was on what's called squirter duty that night. Um, familiar with the term squirter. Yeah. Yeah. Squirter when guys control squirter. Yeah. Duty. Yeah. When they jump, but, yeah, when guys start spraying out in all directions, they could be running for weapons. They could be running just to run. But yeah, you'll explain it better to the audience. For the yeah, audience. that's yeah, that's that's exactly right. You know, sometimes I hear the helos, and they don't exactly have a plan. They just know they don't want to be in the house. You know, and that, you know they 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 assume those the guys in those helos are coming for them. So they'll they'll uh, they'll usually, like I said, it's it's usually not a, a pre planned thing they do. They just run and they hide in a field, they hide behind trees, they hide behind rocks, anywhere they, they feel like they've gone far enough and they just kind of hunker down. Um, so it was, uh, it was me, um, a combo guy, uh, a couple Afghans and a dog guy. 
and um but I, I was the only operator on the um on the uh on the detail going out and that's usually um a no no um even though I had other Americans with me it, you know you you really want more than one operator with you cuz at the end of the day you know that that commo guy was a green beret and the dog handler was a green beret but in those roles are filling they're not they're not filling green beret roles if you will you know their their job now is to be a dog guy their job now is to be the world's best commo guy so i was really the only shooter going out um and that was definitely a mistake on my part but i didn't want to take a i didn't want to take an assaulter off the follow on crew you know and and leave them short so um i didn't take another one with me um and we we went around there were there were several um pockets of of small groups of individuals hiding from us um we we took care of them pretty quick uh and then we hear over the radio that the second place was a dry hole and so now that makes squirter duty even more important because he's he's here we know he's here we know he's somewhere and if he's not in any of these two houses he's probably hiding in one of these squirter pockets so um one of the uh sec what i didn't know at the time but was going to be the second to last pocket of squirters um i come up against um they're hiding in this uh orchard and i hate orchards orchards are are the worst because you can you know isr can tell you uh or whoever's giving you information can tell you how many people are in there but it's 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 rarely right there's just too many places to hide um and it's it's uh people get shot up in in, in orchards you know uh say fairly often but it's it it's not what you want um this orchard has this like half wall around this whole orchard this orchard is about uh, it's about half the size of a football field with a half wall that surrounds it and we're sneaking up to this orchard and i can see a group of them talking about 10 yards from the maybe five yards from the half wall. And so I tell everyone, um, I don't know if I've ever told this story in, in this much detail. And I tell everyone, I said, Hey, everyone stay here. I'm going to move up to this half wall. And I, after I throw a grenade, then I want you guys to move up online and, you know, and that'll, that'll kick off this, uh, this assault. And I am, I am giddy. Like, I'm already thinking this is going to be awesome. Like the boys by the fire, when they hear this story, it's going to be amazing. And I make it, I sneak my way up to this half wall and I'm kind of laying on my back with the half wall right here. And I get the grenade out and I'm getting ready to chuck the grenade over this half wall. And I'm just, I'm just excited. I'm like, man, this is going to be a good one. And I look over one last time to see if the guys are in their position and this one Afghan is still kind of moving into his position and he trips in the middle of the night, he trips and he lands. And I, I can hear those guys, you know, speak in whatever language they're speaking. I mean, they're, they're super close. And when he trips, they stop talking. It was so loud. And then I hear him running to the half wall. And as I'm standing here, I, their AKs are now on the, over the half wall, just spraying everywhere they don't they just know there is a sound in the darkness and i'm like and i remember sitting there going as they're just empty and mags with their barrels a couple feet over my face going just mad at the afghan that he took this amazing moment from me and so after they get done you know spraying i didn't i i, I felt like i knew they were running away but i didn't want to be wrong you know, and put my, put my hand up there while they're reloading and get my hand shot, holding a grenade. Uh, when I was, yeah, it, what felt like forever it was a couple seconds and I knew they weren't there anymore. I popped up real quick and I threw my grenade as hard as I could. Uh, here's, here's another thing that, uh, will surprise a lot of people. Grenades don't kill people, especially out in, in the, in the open air in a field. I, I mean, you'll wound them and you'll piss them off, but grenades don't kill people and they they end up running away and at this point now i'm just super pissed off at them that they shot at our guys i'm mad that my 
my moment of glory was taken away by an Afghan trip into the dark. And uh, so I make sure that that they're followed and and we haven't got jackpot yet. So I'm fairly certain he's in this group. So they end up running away about a click away, a thousand meters away from the target location. That's normally too far for a small group to venture out from the main element. Every, you know, hindsight's always 2020. At that point, I should have called for a couple more operators to plus up and let them know that I was, you know, going this far away uh, from from the main element. Um, but I didn't. Yeah, you know, I was just out of out of uh, anger, followed them, and um, at this point, I get talked on, and and that I get told, hey, they are in this, they're in this area. Um, and as we get really close to them, it's just, it's just the way the world works. Our comms go completely dark. I, I don't, I don't, we can't get a message out. We can't get a message in. So now it's just me and this small team without any comms at all, wandering around this small area that we know they're at, but we can't get any further intel of, 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 a, of exactly where they're hiding like we, we kind of normally do. Um, so there is this, and we're in this big field. The best way to describe it is there's this big bomb crater in, in this field. And uh, I remember going up, looking inside it. It was a very dark night, no loom night. You know, your nods don't work as good on a no loom night. Like your nods aren't just magic. They amplify the existing light. So a little bit of moonlight helps out your nods immensely. So it was a no moonlight, no loom night, and it was raining that night. And so, you know, they're all fogged up, no loom. I looked down there and it didn't look like anything. So we go searching around. At this point, we get a little bit of radio chatter in and out talking about, hey, where are you guys at? Um, hey, the helos are running out of gas. You know, they're either going to have to go all the way back and refuel and come back, which is going to take an hour, or we need you guys to hurry up and, you know, get done doing whatever you're doing and come back. And so uh, we huddle up and I tell him, I said, hey, all right, let's, let's go back. But before we go back, that, that crater, I just, I just, my spider senses, whatever it is, like won't let me you know, like completely, you know, uh, I, I just don't feel right. And they're like, well, what do you want to do? Um, and I had a couple ideas. Uh, I thought about um, throwing a grenade in that crater. Uh, but if I was wrong and they were hiding somewhere else, I would have definitely given up our position. So I didn't want to do that. Um, the, you know, right, wrong, or indifferent, you know, people can armchair this decision all they want. But uh, my plan was, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to get us up on a line and I'm a, I was called a, a white light blip, which means I'm just going to turn on my white light for just a split second and kind of look underneath my nods so I can absolutely rule this out. And, and the thought process was if I white light blip it, maybe, you know, if they're not looking in this direction, they might see something, but you know, chances are they don't, you know, they'll just go, did you see that? But they you know may not have really known where we are. It's really unusual. We don't normally use white lights, you know, on, on nighttime operations. But like I said, I had to clear this depression and my nods just weren't good enough to do it. Um, so I go up there and I go to white light blip it. And I could see at that point, those weren't rocks at the bottom of this depression. It was rocks and guys hiding underneath blankets. And so, and in fact, I kind of didn't even intend to see anything. I kind of was just like, well, I'm just going to, I, I blipped it. I started to turn, to turn away. And in my mind, uh, it registered what I just saw. And so I came back and kept the white light on. And I said, it, uh, the G rated version is there they are, get them. And, uh, and you know, and we start, we start shooting them. Unfortunately, I was the only one to take shots, uh, the Afghans were more of a spectator that night. And, uh, the, the first guy I shot was still underneath his blanket. So 
he died, that did, didn't even know why. The second guy I transitioned over to was just kind of starting to look underneath his, his blanket. Um, I had a suppressed gun at the time, but I wasn't running subsonic ammo. So you could, I mean, you can hear it. Right. Uh, so between the white light and, and the rounds going off, I mean, he was interested to see what was going on. And so I gave him the good news. Um, and the, and so, you know, the next guy over, he's a little bit further out underneath his blanket and starting to reach for his gun. And so, uh, I, I give him, I, I give him the, some, the, 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 the same treatment his other two friends got, but every person I'm transitioning over to is a little bit, is a little bit closer to, to being up and ready. And so, you know, I, I send, you know, four to six rounds at, at each guy. But there, here's another thing that it's no one shouldn't say no one, you shouldn't, no one shoots guys twice and, and moves on. Like you, you shoot guys until they, until they stop until they're no longer a threat. So, you know, everyone's getting four or six. You know, the first guy got like eight rounds. Um, when I transition over to the last guy, he, uh, he's got his, he's, he has come, his, he has his gun coming up and I'm still look and I just transitioned over to him and I'm, and I'm thinking he's, he's closer to shooting me than I am him. And, uh, I, I push my gun as, you know, as hard and fast as I can through a couple rounds his way. He, he went on full auto and, and sprayed up. Um, the first couple rounds hit the base of my feet, kind of walking up the, one of the rounds hits me right in the, uh, in my forearm breaks my arm in half. And then the last round as it, as it, as it turned me, it went right through the middle of my nods and broke my nods in half and they're dangling on my face. And I spin around like four times and, and hit the ground. And, uh, I remember laying in the mud going, damn it. I knew I was going to get shot one day. I, I was the only guy on my team without a purple heart, the only guy. And I just remember going, that didn't hurt as bad as I thought it was going to hurt. And, uh, at that time, our combo guy, you know, this all happens in a matter of five seconds. Our combo guy runs up and throws a grenade down into the hole or not a hole, you know, down into this big depression and it uh whatever it does it probably lands beside a rock and it goes off it doesn't it doesn't hit him but what it does is it reminds him that he has a grenade and this happened for whatever reason on this particular rotation almost every time we introduce grenades we got a grenade back it's almost like reminding them oh yeah we carry these too so he throws a grenade out of the hole and I'm laying on my back and it lands within arm's distance of me. And what saved my life was a muddy, rainy night. It sunk down into the mud. It went off a couple seconds later. Uh, it blasted my helmet off, my peltors to shred. Yeah, you know, it's got some scarring underneath my uh, my beard. And, you know, I got scars up and down my leg. Um, but generally speaking, that mud tamped that grenade and absorbed most of that explosion. Um, and so now, now I'm shot. My nods are shot off. I get hit by a grenade just a couple seconds later. And, uh, and he goes to crawl out of the hole and, uh, our, our combo guy, you know, eventually fills him in with a, with an absolute full mag. I mean, all 30 rounds <laughs> into this guy and, and, and it's over kind of, um, so now he actually, gosh, I'm sure he gets as, as he's crawling out, he, 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 he sends out a couple like kind of security rounds and then tries to crawl out and he hits our combo guy in the leg. And so our combo guy's shot and then kills him. I'm shot. I have no nods. Um, you know, I, I have an arm that we, to get to that point, we jumped a lot of walls trying to make a straight line to this point. Now I can't jump walls. You know, I, I got a broken, I got a, I got a, um, uh, oh gosh, can't believe I forget these words. Uh, I got a tourniquet on my arm that without a doubt felt 10 times worse than getting shot. The tourniquet was absolutely excruciating. Um, and it took us almost an hour to get back to our, uh, 
to our element. And during this hour, we made another mistake of, um, it was again, that, that village was pretty lively. And so we're, we're trying to sneak our way back, but we can't use the back roads if we will. Like we literally kind of have to use trails and roads within the village to, to quickly get back to our element. Well, when we stopped and checked out all of my, um, my injuries, we used red light because we were still in a tactical situation, which we, I, I know better. The problem with using a red light is you can't see blood underneath a red light. And now my biggest injury that I was concerned about was, was my arm. I, I, I didn't complain about the massive bleeding in my leg or in my side because I didn't even, I didn't even feel that, that that had happened. And so we never did a full body check on me to see if I had any other injuries. We just addressed the big injury without addressing the, you know, doing a full body check again, something, something we knew better than, and just, you know, didn't, didn't do it right when it counted. So about 45 minutes into this walk back that we had to take the long way around, um, I start blocking out and I don't know at the time, I didn't know why I was blocking out and, um, and I'm telling like, Hey guys, we got to stop. Like I'm going to throw up and I'm, I'm about to pass out. And they're like, you know, Brent, do not pass out. Like we're not carrying your big ass. Like we have another guy, you know, with a shot leg. He can't carry you. Like you've got to suck this up. And I remember telling you, Hey, I don't control if I black out guys. I'm just telling you it's about to happen. Like I, and they're like, well, do what you can. Uh, we eventually made it back to the, uh, to the rest of the element. And then, and at this point I'm limping and, uh, I don't even know why I'm limping. I just know my leg hurts. And our, our medic comes up and he goes as, as cool as a cucumber. Hey Brent, how's it going? Not good, Dan. I'm shot. He goes, why? He goes, he goes, I can see that. He goes, anything else wrong with you? I said, no, I'm just shot. Please look at my arm. None of the fentanyl lollipops are working. I, I took everyone's, I, I took everyone in patrol has a fentanyl lollipop, including me. I took mine. I took his, I took his, I'm eating everyone's fentanyl lollipop trying to get rid of this pain. And it just wouldn't help with the pain at all. And he goes, what's wrong with your leg? I said, nothing. It's my arm. For the love of God, look at my arm. And he, and he laughs and he sticks his thumb and, and this hole in my leg and says nothing. And I was like, Oh, I'm Dan, why would you do that? He's like, and he's like, you're such an idiot. He's, and he cuts off my pant leg. He's like, what happened to your leg? And that was the first time I really realized that I had, I had eaten that grenade and didn't really know it. I was passing out from a loss of blood. Um, right. and by the time I actually got to the helicopter, I, I did pass out from a lack of blood and I, and I passed, uh, uh, I woke up in Bagram the next day, you know, af after surgery. Um, and I remember that, and I remember sitting on the, on the, on the, the hospital bed going, that was a crazy night. I kind of can't believe we got out, uh, can't believe we got out of that one. That, that is an unbelievable story. <laughs> How long is the road to recovery for you? Not long. I, I, I never missed a rotation. Yeah. I missed a couple jump trips. Um, the, uh, the biggest thing was, um, I kept, they kept on doing washout surgeries on me um, because I, 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 infection was uh, was a serious concern. I had taken my my antibiotic pills. Luckily, it was one of the things I did do right. You know, we were always told, you know, you get shot, blown up, you know, something, and you know, and the nastiness of Afghanistan, you take these pills, and that's actually what saved my life. And even with those pills, um, you know, infection was was a a, a big problem within my body. Um, uh, I, we finally got the infection, uh, under control. You know, the you know, doctors were trying to, trying to be nice, but they were like, Hey, you should know, like, if we can't get this under control, you, you might lose your arm. And so, you know, every time I went under surgery, you know, I was always the first thing I checked to see if I still had my arm. Um, they never ended up having to take my arm. Um, they put a massive plate in there to, to keep my, uh, to keep my arm together. Um, and the bones, the bones actually grow back pretty fast. And, uh, I was down for three months, 
mean, I wasn't back to a hundred percent, but I, I, I could operate three, you know, three months later. And, uh, like I said, never, never missed a rotation out of, uh, out of it. Curious to get your opinion, which one do you find to be the more complete dominant unit and why? This is, uh, it's funny you ask this. And, uh, so I just finished coaching football for three years, coaching high school football, uh, which I was asked to do. I, I don't know any, I learned, but just because of like my coaching the heart and stuff. So the unit guys, we have heart. I mean, people meet me and they're just unimpressed. I mean, I'm just a five, seven like dude, but you don't want to go against me <laughs> still. You know what I mean? I will go against anybody and win. Like it's just in me, but man, I mean, I know some, some seal team six guys and they just, I don't know, have better recruiting. They are just bigger and studlier. So it's like, if it's going to be UFC, we're probably, we're probably going to lose because <laughs> we got just a lot of skinny scrawny guys, but you know, little guys I know that killed more people than malaria, uh, you know, so I don't know, man, just SEAL Team 6, they're more impressive looking and sounding. And they're good dudes. Like, I met them, man. Like, we work together sometimes over there. And I caught, you know, caught up with some of them on the TV show SEAL Team. So a lot of that hostility went away as you meet them and talk to them and stuff. Right. Um, I mean, one of them put a laser on me and I can never forgive that. Like, <laughs> we're getting out of a, to go on a patrol and this guy points his laser at me and my team leader and you know like he's thinking we're bad guys and it's like so yeah that was a problem <laughs> how how did uh, that situation get resolved oh god man it's like our that's when our commanders really step in when we do uh units joint things together um you know they just they're awesome they don't we're better at hostage rescue you know, when I was talking about somebody's grabbing this, it's like paint. This that's our bread and butter. So, so that's a good answer. That's they're better yeah. looking, is what you're saying. But yeah, if you got to get a hostage, call Delta Force. Yep. <laughs> I'm so glad that you mentioned Syria because ISIS obviously did horrific things in Syria and Iraq, and I'm curious if you think the general public has any idea of the savagery of some of the people that we're dealing with in that region of the world. And I want to preface this. When I was in college, ISIS was starting to become like a really big problem. And I remember I, I was a poli-sci major, which was the most useless degree in the history of the world. <laughs> but we would have debates about like, you know, the rise of ISIS, Al-Qaeda, all this terrorism stuff. And there were kids at a major university that were saying there's really no difference between the terrorists and us. And they're only terrorists because we backed them into a corner. I'm like, are you, you realize they're burning people in cages, right? Dude, what do you, what, how different is it compared to the reality on the ground when you're dealing with those animals? Animals is exactly what they are. You know, and people ask me about, you know, you know, so uh, getting shot, losing teammates, PTSD, whatever it is, uh, or, you know, or, or, or if it's, you know, taking another person's life. And I always said, I, I never felt like I ever took another person's life. I shot a lot of two-legged animals. I shot a lot of people that were not human and did not deserve to be on this earth. So I sleep like a baby at night. And ISIS, without a doubt, was the most you know savage enemy we had come across. They had they had this um this young when when Raqqa was still their their stronghold. They had this uh, battalion called the Young Lions Battalion, and they were like seven and eight year old kids, and they were training them to be soldiers, um, which isn't that unique, except their final exercise was they would put them through this like CQB shoot house, and they would have live people, like enemy, like POW, Kurds, Christians, bound and gagged, and the same way we would go through and shoot paper targets in a shoot house, they're shooting people on their final exercise, training these kids to to murder. It's it's abs again, you know, the, that Jordanian pilot that they set on fire alive in a cage. 
um, you know, the the Coptic Christians in, in Israel that they marched, I can't, I think it was 40 of them to the beach and just murdered them. The beheadings, uh, I mean, you just, you, you name it, they were, they, uh, they deserved everything they got and more. And to be honest with you, we should have gotten involved in that, in that a lot earlier. That, you know, the, the only, the only mistake America made was not doing anything until they had taken over half of Syria and half of Iraq. And now we were like, oh, maybe we should do something about this. And as I got older, I'm not the person that says we should be the world's police. I, I had no problem of pulling out of Afghanistan. I, I have no problem of, of, uh, you know, of not being the world's police, but the moment they started cutting off American heads, we should have showed up and we could, and we should have, we could have, and ISIS would have been a blip on the radar, but they cut off five American heads and we still didn't do anything about it until they had almost taken over Iraq. It's, it really was a, uh, a blunder on, on America's part. To be honest with you. Does it feel better killing someone like that compared to maybe, you know, uh, a regime loyalist or, or maybe, I hear a lot of guys talk about some of the guys they fought in Afghanistan. They almost, I wouldn't say feel bad for them, but they're like, is this guy purely evil? Maybe, maybe not. But they all say when it came to ISIS, it just felt better. Did, would you agree with that? I, I would. I mean, the, the way I would rate it, if you will, and, and everyone will have a different you know experience and a different answer. Um you know, in, in Iraq, sometimes we were in the middle of, you know, of, of a civil war, you know, at some point, you know, that at the um, uh, Afghanistan, I, I respected uh, the guys in Afghanistan. They, you know, they always come out to fight, you know, and they're at least willing to die for their cause. Um, uh, but man, I, I really, really, really hated ISIS. I, I never walked by a dead ISIS body with anything other than just joy. Were those I, know guys, I know that sounds weird, but I'm no, just, no, it doesn't I'm sound, just, no, it doesn't sound weird at all. Yeah. Were the, you know, ISIS presented it and I, and I, I'm enjoying this a lot. I think our viewers are going to be fascinated by this, especially the younger ones. ISIS is, they projected, you know, we're so tough. We're so violent. We're, we're, we're you can't reach the level that we get to. When you, if you captured any of these guys, did they drop the tough guy act pretty quickly or did they try to maintain that in custody? Uh, you got, you got, a, you had a, um, a good mix of, uh, like some of the foreign fighters that would come through that they were, they were tenacious, you know, and they'd look at you like, man, if, if you'd take these flex cuffs off me, I'd, you know, I'd choke the life out of you right now. I mean, they just stare at you with dead eyes. Uh, and, but, uh, yeah, you, you, you get a, you get a mixture of, of everything. And there, there are plenty of ISIS fighters on the front lines, you know, especially when the, you know, the, the March to Raqqa was going on that they didn't want to be, they didn't want to be on the front lines, but it was either stay on the front lines and fight or, um, you know, or retreat and get killed by ISIS. And you could still say, well, you know, you still enjoyed watching them die, you know, cause they, you know. Yeah, like they they wrote they they raised their hand to come to come fight for evil, and then they found out what evil was, and so you already voted, uh, you came to do this, and now you know be careful what you wish for. What are your rules of engagement like in a situation like that where you know it's not like World War II where guys are wearing uniforms? You can look over there like oh those are Germans, those are Japanese. It's like the civilian population is wearing correct me if I'm wrong, pretty much the exact same thing as everyone else. So do you, do they have to fire at you first? Or if you see a guy with an AK coming 200 yards off, can you engage him? What are, what's the situation like that? So, and you know, here, here's something that uh, I think is, is a misconception that everyone understands is everyone has the same rules of engagements. Everyone's got the same rules of engagements and the, and the rules of engagements are, um, the uh you know anyone that's that's a that's a a threat to you um you know you you can engage and there's there's two words i'm probably not going to remember off the top of my head now that uh, i'm on a podcast having to remember them uh, i 
immediate threat and imminent threat. Those are the those are the two things that everyone has within their ROE. And I'll tell you exactly what that means. An immediate threat is exactly what you're talking about. A guy with an AK, I come into a room, you know, or I turn the corner on a street, and there's a guy with an AK, and it's not just a guy with an AK, he could be a policeman. But he looks at me and he raises his AK. He clearly he's an immediate threat to me. I can I can shoot him all day long. And those those engagements are never questioned. They're they're just they're cut and dry. Here's where it gets, here's where it gets uh, um, different, really, between the different units. Everyone has imminent threat as well, but not everyone, not everyone acts on imminent threat in the same way. And 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 I'll explain that. Imminent threat means I'll I'll make up a situation that's never happened. Um, a guy could be on a cell phone across the street. And if I believe, if I truly believe he's calling in a QRF, I don't have to wait for the QRF to get here to go, oh, I'm going to shoot that guy now because he was calling in a, a QRF on a cell phone. I mean, he is an, he's an imminent threat. Right. Um, if a guy is, and these are all subjective calls that, you know, that the guy on the ground gets to make and has to live with. If a guy is running around, you know, let's, Taken to Afghanistan, he's running to the uh, to the base of the mountain, and if I believe, based on intel, that they have fighting positions at the base of the mountain, I don't have to wait for him to get to the base of the mountain and grab a gun to go. That's what I thought, and now that he's armed, we'll shoot it out. I can shoot him as he's running away, going to that you know to to that uh, fighting position, but. Yeah, you, know, you better be, but you'll be questioned on it and you better be able to articulate, you know, and, and with reasonable, you know, reasonable justifications of, of, of why you took those shots. Because I, I also assure you, even though those, they seem like loose rules of engagements and they kind of are, um, but if, if you have a guy on your team taking advantage of, uh, you know, of those, of those, he'll, he'll find his way off the team really quick, but we we're, we're not the evil people right. uh, the rest of the world perceives us to be. We we don't put up with that, um, and and really more um, more importantly, you know, to me, it's more of a uh, it's and and the, and the the unit will ask you this all the time. It's not necessarily the decision you made. They want to know why you made that decision. Why did you make it? So to you know. Yeah, you could have the 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 same decision, but one could, but the reason you made it could be wrong, and that says way more about it. So, if you have a guy that per, that is perceiving things to just not be the ground truth, you know, and he's he's shooting at people because what is really happening is something way more dangerous in his mind, then he doesn't have a good grasp on the reality of the situation, and that's more or less, you know, the reason why we're going to get rid of him. Uh, well, so that's actually uh, so so very quickly. Um, I was I got lucky in so I was there after Anaconda. So after Anaconda happened, which basically moved all the you know Taliban to essentially Pakistan. So when I got there it was right after Anaconda. So we basically that deployment. My first, we built all the outstations on the Pakistani, or not on, but near the Pakistani border. So all the places that you hear about, Asadabad, Jalalabad, the Korgal Valley, which it really wasn't called that at that time, but all those areas, that's when we, um, that's when we built those those fire bases, and um, so I was lucky. I was at a, a you know a very very small. Uh, I mean, it was really like a, a, a comp of small compound um, with, it was just one platoon. I was a sniper at that time and I got attached to a unit team because they didn't have a sniper. So I got to work with them on a couple of missions. And after that, I was like, yep, this is what I'm going to do. And um, so then as soon as I got back from Afghanistan, I, I put in a packet. So let me ask you about that. I want to drill down. So you're attached to a unit team. You're not a member of the unit at this time. You're an Army Ranger. What was your perception of those guys the first time you got to work with them? Because I hear from a lot of people, and I'll paraphrase, 
when they meet, when they work with members from the unit, it's like they think they're larger than life. Like these dudes are superheroes compared to the rest of us. Is that kind of the same impression you had? I, I, the best way I can describe it, or not the best way I can describe it, the, a thing that does a great job of capturing it is Black Hawk Down. I mean, they really did a good job. I mean, you saw them as gods, uh, you know, and, and when I was a ranger, I was just like, it just, it was like they, when it came to combat, it was like they were Morpheus, you know, it's like they knew what was going to happen before, you know, it was just, it was, it was very strange. And, uh, um, and also actually the guy that led the team that I was attached to, um, and I'll just say this now, cause it's what are the odds four year, whatever, I don't, I don't I forget the exact time, but four years later, that guy that ran that team four years later, he is the exact same person that put the tourniquet on my arm. Walk me through how this happens, because it's an explosive device. How, what do you remember from how it went down? So, so there's a lot to give the full explanation of why, I, I can't give the full explanation of, of why what happened happened. Um, Got it. Uh, talk about a thing that i can't talk about got it uh, no i understand <laughs> yeah, yeah but but it's unfortunate because if if i could talk about that part it would make so much sense um but the, the very short version is um we were in solder city that night um and we were we did a um uh, we did an offset so we were walking through solder city at night um and we hit a house like that's the house we hit the house we go inside and you know it's just like or i assume like a law enforcement you know you, you can tell when you go in a house if the people are guilty or not you can just feel it you know generally in my experience if you go in there and they're shouting and the women are going crazy and the, it's 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 the wrong house if you go in and no one says a word it's the right house because yeah. the guilty just shut up and don't say anything. The not guilty, you're like, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> you know right. I mean? Yeah. Guilty, they're just like, yeah, we know why they're here. You know, you know, it's not surprising. Uh, they're not happy about it, but they're not surprised. And uh, so, anyways, that that house, I was like, nah, just no, nah, not not these people. And um, so, anyways, we heard that uh, uh, I think two teams. Uh, they're like, hey, we actually think it's over here. So two teams went out. One was actually a team from um, from the unit that I now play on TV uh, that was attached to us. They went out. They went on the front side or went around to go to the front side of this other house. And uh, my team was basically going towards the back side of the house. So very shortly, what happened was it was the wrong house. And when we hit that one house the actual house it was which was next door which is not exactly next door because Sutter city is kind of weird of how it's built um but you know they heard us they were getting ready prepping you know their gear you know and so they were ready to go so when that team came around uh a bunch of dudes opened up out of the front uh what i assume would be the living room uh with ak's and shot i think they shot three if I'm not mistaken, they shot three of the members of that team. Um, two of them were pretty much out of the fight at that point. Uh, but they were, hey, I mean, it was heavy, heavy. I, I wasn't on that side of the house, but just hearing it, I was like, oh, man, that's extreme. So um, we ran in. I ran into the back door, which came into the kitchen, cleared through there, um, went in the hallway. And those same guys, as we approached that room, um shot through the walls of the of, of that hallway shot the guy next literally right next to me um so then we backed off and then um we were in a and i got to draw it out but we were in a tactical position that was just very there wasn't a lot we could do um so we were trying to kind of figure out how to solve it um and the next thing i know i remember I remember just the whole room or actually it wasn't really a room. It was the hallway, you know, so it was more like a, a two 
straight at me and just everything exploded. And I, I actually remember hitting the ground and looking up down the hallway. And I was just, um, I was just confused. Um, I didn't know what had happened. Um, and I can say, you know, getting shot at, okay. Um, it's one thing, but the explosion made me feel small. It was like a superhero just grabbed me and was like, or it, it was like the Hulk grabbed me and was like, eh, eh, eh. it was just, it was a, it was a, it, it felt like a supernatural power. Um, and it blew. So it was a nighttime hit. It blew my, um, nods and my nod mount off my face. So I went from, you know, under nods to not be able to see anything. Um, it obviously my eye, my arm, I thought it blew off. Um, I'm trying to think of what else it wrecked, but wrecked several things, but, um, and everything was pitch black for me and I really didn't know what was going on. Um, I just felt my arm was blown off. So I got up and uh, walked outside uh, to the back and there was a wall that we had hopped um, to, to, to get in. <laughs> that wasn't happening. So I just put my back against the wall and tried to um, take care of myself. But, it, but I, I never lost consciousness. Um, the only time actually I did lose consciousness is when, and I still to this day don't know how they got me over that wall. I have no idea. But other than that, probably five minutes that they got me over the wall, um, I never lost consciousness. And uh, I am literally stunned. I I don't even know what to say. That is every part of that story from the moment the first shots rang out to you getting back over the wall, losing consciousness is hard for me, who's obviously never been in a gunfight. And I assume most people watching this who've never been in a gunfight to even comprehend. What, did you take a moment was there a moment when you looked down at your arm and you kind of understood like, oh shit, like I'm in deep trouble? Or were you in such a state of shock that you didn't even really quite frankly understand what had just happened to your body? And, and if you can explain, how, how much of your arm are you able to see? Like, do you have a good assessment of how damaged it is in the moment? Uh, so that's not a question I think I've ever been asked, but it's a good question. So when it happened, um, it, it killed the nerve in my arm to about here. So if, and I know this sounds weird, but it's the best way to describe it. So it felt gone from here. I couldn't, it felt not there. I know it sounds weird. Um, and then I, I got outside and there was a, like a porch light and I looked at it. And if you can see, so this, this was all gone. I mean, it was holding on by, you know, half, basically half my arm. And it was broken in, I want to say, eight places. So I can't even replicate how it was hanging. And then up here, this was flayed out this way, and this was flayed out this way. So from about just above my wrist to my shoulder, when I looked at my arm in that light, I mean, it was, it was hamburger. It, it was done. It was hamburger meat. It was, it was zombie flesh. So yeah, I looked at it and I went, well, that's gone. That just, that's, that, that's going. Um, and, uh, and I knew it was bad. And, um, and then my first thing was, uh, well, the arm's going, I'm losing my right arm. That sucks. And then I thought, and I'll never forget this thought in a million years, then I literally saw that I had an arterial bleed and I went, you know, you're losing your arm. And then I was like, Oh, Oh, I've got an arterial bleed, which if you have an arterial bleed, you've got, I'll be conservative and say 45 seconds to a minute to do something before you won't die. But in about 45 seconds, you're going to lose enough blood to where it's going to be hard for you to, to, to have the strength to solve it if that makes sense. So yes. I remember seeing that and going, you know, well, okay. Yeah. You're going to lose your right arm, but you better solve that bleed or you die. And that would be stupid. Don't know why I use that word, but in my head, I remember saying, and then you die and that would be stupid. So, um, yeah, I knew, I knew how bad it was. And I'll tell you this. I, 
after I looked at it under that light, I did not, and I'm not exaggerating. Well, I did actually look at it one more time, but I didn't look at my arm uncovered for probably a year. I mean, I literally like ignored it. In fact, in hindsight, I should have wore a freaking eye patch on my right eye. I just didn't look. I didn't want to be reminded of it. Um, the, the next time I looked at it was actually when they saved it because they told me they were going to cut it off when I went into surgery. Um, but uh, I woke up the next morning, looked over. It was there. Um, and, you know, it, it, they saved it. And actually, by the way, they told me. Um, now, again, I was on a lot. When, when they told me that they were going to cut it off, I was on quite a lot of drugs. I was like, do whatever you want. Cut off the legs. <laughs> I don't care, you know, I was like, <laughs> crazy. Um, but uh, uh, they told me when they saved it, the only reason that they even attempted to save it was because how many extremities, ex uh, how many extremity surgeries they had done in during that time frame because of V-beds. Um, so they just were now so advanced on, uh, and again, I don't know the details, but they they just had new techniques. That he, he said a year ago we would have cut it off without even attempting to, uh, you know, again, do something different. Did Did you ever find out what had happened to all the bad guys that were in the house? Did anyone ever kind of debrief you and say, hey, after the explosion went off, here's kind of how everything shook out afterwards? Yes, that was years later. But yes, yeah. The um, I've never told anyone this, um, but I'll tell you um, or everyone <laughs> watching this. Uh, only one person lived on that whole thing. Uh, and only one person lived. And the reason that person lived is because I didn't shoot him. It... And I could have. He actually had an AK when I came into the room his gun hit me in the chest. And so and I, was it, oh, sorry, go ahead, sorry. No, his, his gun hit, like, it was so close, I turned and his gun hit me. And the only reason I didn't shoot him is I could see behind him, uh, I can't remember if it was pink or purple, but it was a color that stood out. I wanna say pink, but again, I, I don't remember. But I could see like a pink or purple outline behind him. His wife was behind or one of his, I don't know, was behind him. And that in that, you know, millisecond, you know, so I ended up taking the gun from him. I threw him outside the room. They took him. But he's the only one that lived. And um, ironically, it's one of my few regrets uh, of my time because that guy ended up being the main facilitator of the whole thing. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Wow. So all the other guys, you know, they weren't around to do anything anymore. But my, you know, for many years, I wondered if he went through the system and then got out and went and hurt other people. So I've, I've, one of my biggest regrets is, is that. Interesting. That's a fascinating, that's a fascinating answer. I want to get in now to the injury, uh, the explosion, and then you transitioning into that non combat role are you able to talk about it all what happened and how you were hurt yeah i i mean it, it's all second third hand information i don't remember any of it um we were uh in al Qaeda, uh out in the western part of iraq and uh we were you know hunting targets out there um we as it's told to me we you know we had we had a target close to the syrian border and uh Basically, be due to assets, we had to drive out there. Um, uh, the Marines that we we're there with told us that you know that that area has been mined for you know for forever. Um, you probably shouldn't drive. Well, you know, we it came down to it that was that was the option that we had. Well, we took a mine clearing team. Uh, they cleared the way uh, as we as we went. The actually the two Humvees that were with the mine clearing team in front of us. We were the lead vehicle in our element. Uh, we were in a, a very large, like, armored personnel carrier called a uh, Pensgauer. Um, I'm sorry, a Pander. And anyway, so we were driving, and again, I don't remember, as, but the, I guess the two vehicles, two Humvees in front of us, drove over Russia Plate, 
IEDs. Uh, they weren't heavy enough to set them off. Uh, we were. Um, explosion went off. The that sympathetically detonated a thermobaric weapon, which is like a a, uh, a a rocket of sorts that when it shoots out, when it goes off, it puts explosive dust in the air, and then that ignites. Uh, it's mainly made for clearing caves and buildings and stuff. So that went off inside the vehicle too. Uh, killed, as there's six, seven, eight of us in the vehicle. Killed four in, pretty much instantly, or, with, or within 24 hours it expired. And then the other three of the remaining four were maimed pretty good, and uh, one one just walked away. Uh, it was kind of amazing. And it was, um, we were numbered, so we had six guys on our team, team leader being um, number one, you know, some letter combination number one. Down to six is the newest guy. Uh, and then we had a, a ranger as a gunner, and then one of our, our uh, NBC guys, or nuclear biological chemical guys, who's our driver. Um, it Of the six guys on our team, it killed everybody. It, regardless of where you're seated, the uh, explosion killed everybody that was uh, even number and was married uh, or had kids. All the single guys and the odd numbers are just maimed or left untouched, which was, which was kind of odd. But, you know, I, again, I, I don't remember any of it. Um, they transported me to back to al Qaeda by helicopter. Uh, we had a surgical response team that flew out on their jet and met us there. Uh, got me stabilized. Uh, as long as the other people, I can only speak to what I, I know about myself. Uh, got stabilized. Uh, put me on a helicopter, uh, medevac, flying back to Balad to do the brain surgery. Um, I'd had I, my left frontal lobe was uh, kind of eviscerated. Um, they on, on the flight as they were going out, the SRT docs gave the PA that was flying with me. Like, hey, here I was on oxygen, and they're like, hey, there's extra oxygen under the jump seat in the back of the helicopter. Uh, I think it was just a, a regular uh, kind of vanilla uh, medevac bird. It wasn't one of you know, like 160ths or anything. One of, one of any of our medic, medevac birds. So we're flying back. Uh, so my ox pulse goes way down. Um, so like, okay, well, he started bagging me. Uh, you know, that's not good. And uh, the oxygen bottle's empty. So it goes, uh, gets another one. And the one that... I, We'll just say I was a Marine bird, nothing, again, nothing disparaging about the Marines, but whoever's flying the, uh, the medevac bird, their oxygen bottles don't fit in our, they don't, they don't connect for whatever reason. So the first one doesn't connect. So now it's, you know, bagging. So you know, we got a long flight, like multiple hours. So now the oxygen, flight. so there's bagging and bagging. I, I, I flatline once, they start me up again, still bagging, flatline again. So end up flatlining three times. They, they get me going, and then uh, this guy, his name's Chris, is the PA. He's like, "What? We're, we're just not going to make it there in time. Like, we can't just keep restarting this guy." And he's like, "Now he put his hands down and his head, or his, his head down in his hands, and looked down and saw this extra bottle that they had told they totally put out under the seat, and that actually was compatible with the system." So, um, hooked that up and made it back to uh, a lot. Got brain surgery. Woke up some months later in, in uh, Walsh Reed. Wow. I am actually, I'm speechless hearing that. So you say you woke up a few months later, so you have no recollection of entire months that followed that. Yeah, I guess, I guess it was about 45 days. I woke up, so they woke me up at, at one point because uh, I was in a medically induced coma. So they brought me out of that. My dad was in the ICU with me when they did that. And I would, I guess whatever drugs they give you make you agitated and kind of like itchy. And uh, they're like, he's, he's not going to, he's not going to, you know, he, potentially he won't, he won't uh, like this. But they wanted to see where, like cognitively, where it was. So they wake me up. Uh, I don't remember this, but they're, you know, my dad's telling me, he's like, um, you know, they started asking you questions. And I thought it was 19, it was 2005. I thought it was 1996. Or not, I'm sorry, yeah, 1996, I'd, I'd broken my femur on a jump with the Rangers. I thought I was in the hospital for that. Um, so they're like, okay, 
probably should put him back in a coma. So before before I went in, I was, I told him, I was like, hey, I just had this dream. And I told him this dream, a very kind of, uh, you know, trippy LSD type uh, dream. And they put me back in a coma, wake me up two weeks later. Uh, I kind of know what's more of what's going on. Um, they're like, okay, we're going to keep him out of the coma. I was like, hey, dad, I just had this dream. Tell the same dream verbatim. I don't remember that. I don't remember either of those instances. So about two weeks later, I start generating new memories. Like people would come visit me and they're like, oh, you know, Jim, I haven't seen you in, in years. Like I, I was here like a week ago. Um, I just, you, my brain was still healing. It wasn't generating. And I was like, hey, dad, I just had this dream. And I told him the same dream verbatim. And it was, uh, I still remember it you know, and everything. And it wasn't until that, that PA, Chris, who flew with me when he was retiring, uh, he, well, he got an award and at his retirement and, and we sat down together and he's like, Hey, do you even really know what happened? And he told me this whole story up till, you know, the, the brain surgery, uh, in, in, uh, in Balad. And he's the one that's telling me about flatlining and the other guys in the team, like when they actually expired and, and, and everything. I'm like, wow, as it's pretty much, it's, just, <laughs> it's the dream I've had and kept regurgitating. It's just uh, like mine's super lucid and trippy and compared to what was actually happening in real life. So it was kind of about interesting. That's basically all I have from, you know, even I retrograded amnesia for two weeks prior to the in actual incident. So basically there's about a two month period that that's all I have. It's this weird dream. And how long did it take for you to be cleared to return to the, to the special mini mission unit in your new role that they transitioned you into? Well, so actually I stayed in the same role, but when I went to get out, they wanted to medical medically board me out of the army. Um, so I, but I, at the time I didn't want that. I didn't really know that much about it. I just saw it to me like they're trying to kick me out of the, out of the army, right? Squadron was still deployed over in Iraq that got extended. Uh, so basically, there's another guy that got hurt about a month after me. He was in the hospital. One of our hand-to-hand -hand instructors was up visiting him, and I ran into him. And I was like, I was like, hey, can you get me out of here? And he's like, well, sure. He's like, I'm driving back to North Carolina tonight. So uh, when I got Roger, I'm like, let's go. And Roger drove me home and. Just kind of went home and lived on you know, one floor of my house. I had my own house at the time and lived on that floor. I didn't want to try and really go mess with the steps too much. But then uh, we started slowly going back into work. And then you know, when, was, when the squadron came back, just went back into the rotation. Ended up deploying two more times. Um, and then I uh, started having seizures after that. Uh, so you know, I had a chicken or egg thing, you know, did I... I had seizures because I was epileptic or, you know, epileptic and had seizures type thing. But, but uh, yeah, so had seizures and then that kind of uh, forced me out of the uh, deployable uh, operational side of the unit into support. So you had just mentioned the jihadis and I, and I want to get into that because I think young people kind of, as we talked about a moment ago, who certainly weren't alive, maybe fail to understand what you're talking about when you're talking about jihadis and how they're different than maybe what people perceive as a standard enemy. So can you explain to the audience the difference between a loyalist to the regime and someone who is a violent jihadi terrorist? Yeah, when you look at the loyalists to the regime, they had, you know, their first thing was their country and everything else. Granted, they were, you know, not the most, uh, you know, not the, their country was Iraq wasn't run smooth. It was a dictatorship, you know, everything else going on within there. But it was still about Iraq and everything else. Um, so there was some loyalty just as a country. But with the the folks coming in, the religious fundamentalists, you know, they were they're out just to kill Christians. And because they hate, you know, Christians. Uh, and it really stinks because of the fact that for them, it was like, well, the great jihad is now called basically go to war because, you know, now it's like they've got to get rid of, you know, the uh, all us Christians and everybody else, just the the folks in the Middle East that aren't supposed to be there in their mind. And so it was kind of their call to arms worldwide. And we ran into folks, you know, all over that we've either captured or killed that were definitely not from Iraq. 
Um, so it's, you know, different. I mean, it's, it's just a crazy thing, but it was really a call, call to arms. We, we hit a, uh, a safe house one time uh, in 03, October, yeah, 31st, actually 03, um, when we were in Baghdad and we went all the way out to our Ramadi and the guys all had the same jogging pants, shoes and everything. And what they had done is they, they come over there for the jihad. So they take their passports and they can't leave. So now they've got control of them and they can't leave the country. So they kind of get them in on this whole thought, oh yeah, you're going to come in, you're going to do this, you're going to, and then all of a sudden they take them and then they just, they start, you know, kind of like just keeping them uh, to do what they need them to do and talking them into other things and, and so forth. And some of them, you know, some of them are all about it. I don't know. It's just crazy. When you would get into uh, gunfights and engagements with those guys, I mean, were they competent fighters? Were they skilled in any way? Or were they just kind of idiots who got their hands on an AK and had this sadistic mindset? I mean, were they able to put up a really good fight? I think, um, you know, you had some like anything that had some experience and then some that were just coming over there wanting to get their jihad and then get, they would get whatever training, uh, when they, you know, either arrived in the country before they came directly into Iraq. Uh, so whatever the rat line was, but as we progressed down the road, you know, they started having experienced fighters and they started doing their lessons learned. So it became, um, a, a more hardened fighter, especially with ISIS, you know, I mean, they were a ruthless, ruggedized military in a way. So, um, you know, they, they definitely had some, uh, war hardened individuals. Did you feel when you're fighting the jihadis, the people that are intent on killing, you know, the Christian members of the Christian faith, people that they, uh, didn't feel belong there. Did it feel more justified to you? Did it feel like it was more important maybe than fighting, um, again, the regime loyalists, because, and I'm only speaking for myself here, when I see that level of barbaric behavior, and you're talking about Zarqawi chopping people's heads off and, and people drilling holes into other people's skulls, I see that as a guy who's just some bystander. And I say, that's not even human behavior. That, that's right. what rabid dogs do. And I would think I would much rather prefer to take them out and it would feel better for me, again, as an unbiased observer, than just the standing Iraqi army. Did you feel the same way or were, was it equal to you? Yeah, I think because it, things, you know, transitioned from that regime side to that fundamentalist side. So um, we also had to change some of our tactics and our procedures and everything else and how we did things to cope with these guys because they were coming up with some ingenious ways of doing things along the line as well with some of the IEDs, some of the, you know, the booby trapping the the houses, things like that, using the cell phones to call, to detonate everything. Um, so it became, I think, as much as you say, more violent in that way, because with the regime guys too, we knew that there was a, the end state was trying to get Saddam so that we needed intel as well. We needed to gather that intelligence. There was only so much that was there uh, from previous, uh, you know, just historical data. Then we had them act actually making it, make it real intel and workable intel. Um, but with the fundamentalists, you know, they, uh, if you gave them a chance to vote and we'd say vote based off, okay, does this guy want to just, is he going to go along with the capture or is he wanting to fight? And then let's, let's see who wins, you know, um, they would rather fight than do anything. There was, you know, so many times guys would detonate suicide, suicide vests because it's like, well, they're not going to take me clack themselves off thinking they're killing, you know, other folks around them. Um, but you know, they just, I don't know. They just were different folks. And it was like, we had to get more violent in a way, you know, because again, we were going after Intel and doing things and, and our procedures and everything on the battlefield just had to kind of adjust just like they were doing. That's crazy. I, I truly cannot imagine. And I, you know, I was in college. Um, I started college in what, 2010. So I was in high school when things were getting kind of real bad in the 06, 07 era. And I remember people would always talk about like, you know, do we really need to be fighting these guys? Do Are they really that bad? And I'm like, you know, this Zarqawi guy is literally chopping people's heads off, right? And don't think it stops there. Like if this guy yeah. could, he'd chop all of our heads off too. Fortunately, they dropped a couple bombs on him, I believe, if I recall correctly. Well, that's actually a great segue because I, my very next question is, how did you find out about the unit? And I want to preface that when I interview guys who got into Delta in the 90s and maybe stayed through like 2009, 2010, a lot of them make the comment like we didn't even know the thing existed. 
Like we weren't aware until someone told us we didn't know when we joined the military. Did you, were you aware of what the unit was and what they did? I assume you must have been because you were deploying as a Green Beret in a time of war. Uh, yeah, but I, I never saw those guys. They were still mythical figures, you know, uh, overseas that you never worked with. You never saw, um, the, the only time I really even knew that it existed is because the Q course happens on Bragg and, uh, at, at the end of this road is, you know, supposedly where, where the unit's at, you know, and, and at some point, you know, probably every Q course student, student drives down that road just, just to see the building at the end of that road. Um, so I, I, I knew it existed, uh, because of, you know, being on brag. Um, but oddly enough, I, I knew it existed more because Eric Haney wrote a book called inside Delta force right. you know, while I was in the Q course. And, uh, and I, I read every special operations book I could get a hold of, you know, while I was in the Q course, um, basically from Vietnam to, to more current era. And, uh, so as soon as that thing came out, I, I read it in like 30 hours. So I was, I was well aware of the unit thanks to that book. And, and for our viewers who might not know that book by Eric Caney was the inspiration of the old CBS TV show, the unit, like the mid two thousands. Right. Yeah. yeah. It was a great, it was a great book. I mean, I mean, if, uh, and I, like I said, I remember reading it in the Q course. And so I, at the time, you know, I wasn't worried about going to the unit. I was just, <laughs> I was just going to be happy to be a green beret. Um, so, uh, it wasn't, and you know, till years later that I got to selection, but I remembered those stories of selection from, uh, from his book that were, that were, and that's 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 what most people are mad at him about is uh, he, he is he talked about selection and that's something we just don't talk about. Right. No, I, I I've heard. Uh, well, there's plenty of articles online about how that that drove a, a wedge between him and a lot of other people. Which I will we'll have a question about that later in the interview, kind of on a on a very similar topic. When you finally get there, you've passed selection. You've done all the stuff you got to do to go in. Uh, one of the things I'm curious about. Is it better to be really smart if you want to make the unit, or is it better to be a freak of nature athlete? Do you need a blend? Like if a, if a young man's watching this right now, he's like, I want to do what Brent Tucker did. Better to be smart, better to be tough. What? Uh, that that's a good question. Because to be honest with you, I mean, the, the cliche answer is both, and and that that is an actual answer. You know, as cliche as it is, uh, but I've. Um, you won't see a lot of guys that that aren't um, that aren't very smart, you know, make it to the unit. But I, I've seen I've seen guys that just they were just they were just smart enough. But man, were they you know were they were they strong, you know? And they they're just gonna they're just gonna power their way through everything. And uh, I would argue we we need those guys, you know. But uh, that's definitely not the bulk of our force. Uh, and most guys really are 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 both. Like the, the smartest guys I've, I've, I've ever worked with are, are over at the unit. And how long before, how long after you get through all the training, the selection, OTC, all that stuff, was it before you then actually deployed as a member, as an operator of Delta? Uh, it was just a couple months. I went, went right into a pre-deployment and, and, and right into a deployment. Uh, um, yeah, of course, at, yeah, at, at that time and, uh, you know, and to take a step back, what, what, one of the reasons I, I went there is because I wanted to keep deploying. Um, 20th group, you know, be a National Guard group, at the end of the day, deployed, you know, if, if you wanted to, deployed as much as, as as anyone else. I mean, as I could just raise my hand and, and go overseas, which is what I did a lot. Um, but I Iraq had, had, had gone away. Afghanistan, you know, the writing on the wall on Afghanistan. Um, at the time, I didn't think Afghanistan was going away, but combat operations in Afghanistan were getting harder and harder and harder to get out the gate. Um, and so, uh, you know, the the two reasons I went was I wasn't done going to war. I wanted to, you know, keep deploying. And, uh, and two, you know, I didn't want to retire, you know, thinking, what if? Uh, and I tell people all the time, I, I, I wasn't the best guy on my ODA. You know, there were probably two guys, if you asked me that I thought, you know, if, if you, if you asked me to, who was the best guy on my ODA, I'd probably put two guys ahead of me. And, and that's the truth. Um, but they didn't, they didn't go to selection. 
uh, for whatever reason, and maybe they would have made it, maybe they wouldn't have. Uh, you know, we yeah, the selection's a crazy process. I've seen I've seen guys that I knew in SF their selection that I knew were better than me that didn't make it to the end. And for the life of me, I I you know I I don't know why they didn't, and I don't know why I did. And sometimes that's just uh, yeah, that's it's just how you know life deals your cards. Um, so it was it was a few months, and it just worked perfectly to where. She and I were ready to go when we did. And uh, that was a brutal deployment. <laughs> and, and is that your first deploy? Is that the deployment in 06 that's covered in the documentary? Yes, that's the first one. She and I went on two. She was killed on the second one. But yeah, that first one, we had over 50% casualties, not killed, but in our, our group. Let's talk about that deployment where you had 50%. Do you say 50%? casualties yeah we just had a list on the whiteboard of there was three or four killed uh that was summer of 06 and then uh you know all the shot and wounded was it came to over 50 percent of our squadron that's that's absolutely insane i for the audience listening to this that means 50 percent of the guys there were either wounded or killed in action which is a staggering number is the reason for that that you guys are just doing the frequency of the hits is just at such a high level that you're taking contact on a regular basis. Exactly. Yeah. It's just, you know, we got this target deck we're trying to get to. So you go out on something, it leads to another, you know, in a hundred days, you're doing 90, 100, 110 hits, not including follow on. So it's just nonstop every night. It's great. I mean, it's, um, but yeah, at the beginning too, it was just, you know, everybody was, we're figuring them out. They're figuring us out. I think I heard Chile say in one of your interviews that they're smart or maybe it was Jesse, you know, they, <laughs> they know what they're doing. It's a different kind of war. Ch but Chile, yeah. Chile had said they had come up with some pretty ingenious ways to figure out how to kill Americans and that yep. they had to adapt. I think, and then Chile's exact quote, and I apologize if he's watching this, I get it wrong, that it forced the Americans to adapt and get a little more violent because all the suicide bombings, all the booby traps they were laying out. Is do you is that the same experience you had as well? Yeah, and I I had to be taught that by my team leader. You know, uh, you know I'm like sort of you know going with our culture. We'd have some detainees, and I'm like, okay, guys, you know, like my team leader's like, hey, you know, like like you just said. Speed, surprise, violence of action. If we sacrifice any of those, you have to make it up somewhere else. So there's pretty much no more surprise. And yeah, we can go we can go with speed, but yeah, they they figured out how to how to stop us. How as the dog you, engages. How did you personally handle being on a team that lost 50% of its or had a 50% casualty rate? I mean, that must weigh on your mind and your heart. Or is it a thing where you don't have time to think about it because you're just constantly going back out there? It's actually like a prideful thing. Like we want, we don't get to choose our wars. And every guy I guarantee, you know, wants something like World War II. Like, I mean, once you get to where we got, we know what we can do. You know, I had nightmares of my own Delta troop coming against me when I got home because there ain't, you're not, there's no chance when a troop hits a building, like you're, you're done. So, um, uh, where were we at? Just how you handle the trauma of losing that oh, many guys. It's a, it's like a prideful. I mean, we hit it on the board. It's just like, okay. I mean, yeah, it hurts, but like, we got to go harder. You know, I came home, my daughter was born in 05. We were on a rotation. I came home for a month. It was awesome. You know, that. Delta just loves their people. People are the most important thing. It's the best place in the world to work, we would always say. And I came home and, and you know, two of my buddies were killed while I was home. And then I come back and another one's killed. So you just go harder. Like that's, are we going to win or or not? And yeah, it's a, it's a, like a pride thing, I think. When, you're, when your friends die... And, and th th we're going to get into the very next thing we're going to talk about, Pepper, the, the second deployment. 
but you say you're going harder, but does it become more personal as well? Or is it always just strictly business? Because as a civilian, if someone killed my friends and I had the opportunity to kick in a door, and I'm not trying to be a fake tough guy, I, I, don't, I don't do any of that stuff, obviously. But if you killed my family members, if you killed my friend, like it'd become a personal thing to me. It wouldn't be business anymore. How did you process that? Just like you said, like, actually there was a, there was a time where, you know, we, we had, we caught a recidivist. We had, we had captured some guys, tried to put them through their legal system. You know, I remember once there was a ranger that got shot right above his plate right here. And we just got there and there's this huge puddle of blood and uh, the, the guys, you know, we found them and they're surrendering because they won't fight and they were laughing at us. And that's when I was like, man, <laughs> this has got to change. You know, hey, boss, um, your your intent, commander's intent says kill or capture, right? Yes. OK. In that order, you know, and I like to ask the question with Osama bin Laden. They just, they shot him, you know, there was no, and, and nobody disagrees with that. Right. Right. So what is it? If, if you kill 3000 people, that's okay. You know, where, where's the line for, for just going in to kill somebody? It's tough freaking business. And somebody said, you know, oh, anybody can kill a caveman. Well, how many cavemen have you killed, sir? Because it's tough and it's not natural, but F yeah, man. Like you said, when they, when your friends get killed or a dog gets killed, it's like, it's unspoken. I mean, we just get back to our, our building. We eat, we watch TV. Nobody, you know, nobody's talking. And then we, when we go out again, it's just an unspoken thing. And yes, it's brutal. So you had just mentioned the jihadis and I, and I want to get into that because I think young people, kind of as we talked about a moment ago, who certainly weren't alive, maybe fail to understand what you're talking about when you're talking about jihadis and how they're different than maybe what people perceive as a standard enemy. So can you explain to the audience the difference between a loyalist to the regime and someone who is a violent jihadi terrorist? Yeah, when you look at the loyalists to the regime, they had, you know, their first thing was their country and everything else. Granted, they were, you know, not the most, uh, you know, not that their country was Iraq wasn't run smooth. It was a dictatorship, you know, everything else going on within there, but it was still about Iraq and everything else. Um, so there was some loyalty just as a country, but with the, the folks coming in the religious fundamentalists, you know, they were, they're out just to kill Christians and because they hate, you know, Christians. Uh, and it really stinks because of the fact that for them, it was like, well, the great jihad is now called basically go to war because, you know, now it's like they've got to get rid of, you know, the uh, all us Christians and everybody else, just the the folks in the Middle East that aren't supposed to be there in their mind. And so that was kind of their call to arms worldwide. And we ran into folks, you know, all over that we've either captured or killed that were definitely not from Iraq. Um, so it's, you know, different. I mean, it's. It's just a crazy thing, but it was really a call call to arms. We we hit a uh, a safe house one time uh, in 0, 03, October yeah thirty first actually oh three um, when we were in Baghdad and we went all the way out to our Ramadi, and the guys all had the same jogging pants, shoes, and everything. And what they had done is they they come over there for the jihad, so they take their passports and they can't leave. So now they got control of them and they can't leave the country. So they kind of get them in on this whole thought. Oh yeah, you're going to come in. You're going to do this. You're going to, and then all of a sudden they take them and then they just, they start, you know, kind of like just keeping them uh, to do what they need them to do and talking them into other things and, and so forth. And some of them, you know, some of them are all about it. I don't know. It's just crazy. When you would get into uh, gunfights and engagements with those guys I mean, were they competent fighters? Were they skilled in any way? Or were they just kind of idiots who got their hands on an AK and had this sadistic mindset? I mean, were they able to put up a really good fight? I think, um, you know, you had some, like anything that had some experience and then some that were just coming over there wanting to get their jihad and then get, they would get whatever training uh, when they, you know, either arrived in the country before they came directly into Iraq 
Uh, so whatever the rat line was, but as we progressed down the road, you know, they started having experienced fighters and they started doing their lessons learned. So it became um, a, a more hardened fighter, especially with ISIS, you know, I mean, they were a ruthless, ruggedized military in a way. So, um, you know, they, they definitely had some uh, war hardened individuals. Did you feel when you're fighting the jihadis, the people that are intent on killing, you know, the Christian members of the Christian faith, people that they uh, didn't feel belong there, did it feel more justified to you? Did it feel like it was more important maybe than fighting, um, again, the regime loyalists? Because, and I'm only speaking for myself here, when I see that level of barbaric behavior, and you're talking about Zarqawi chopping people's heads off and, and people drilling holes into other people's skulls. I see that as a guy who's just some bystander. And I say, that's not even human behavior. That That's right. what rabid dogs do. And I would think I would much rather prefer to take them out and it would feel better for me, again, as an unbiased observer, than just the standing Iraqi army. Did you feel the same way or was it equal to you? Yeah, I think because things, you know, transition from that regime side to that fundamentalist side. So um, we also had to change some of our tactics and our procedures and everything else and how we did things to cope with these guys, because they were coming up with some ingenious ways of doing things along the line as well with some of the IEDs, some of the, you know, the booby trap in the, the houses, things like that, using the cell phones to call to detonate everything. Um, so it became, I think, as much as you say more violent in that way, because with the regime guys too, we knew that there was a, the end state was trying to get Saddam so that we needed Intel as well. We needed to gather that intelligence. There was only so much that was there uh, from previous, uh, you know, just historical data. Then we had them act actually making it, make it real Intel and workable Intel. Um, but with the fundamentalists, you know, they, if you gave them a chance to vote and we'd say vote based off, okay, does this guy want to just, is he going to go along with the capture or is he wanting to fight? And then let's, let's see who wins. You know, um, they would rather fight than do anything. There was, you know, so many times guys would detonate suicide, suicide vests because it's like, well, they're not going to take me clack themselves off thinking they're killing, you know, other folks around them. Um, but, you know, they just, I don't know, they just were different folks. And it was like, we had to get more violent in a way, you know, because again, we were going after Intel and doing things and, and our procedures and everything on the battlefield just had to kind of adjust just like they were doing. I, I've heard some people say that the biggest misconception about that particular unit is that, you know, everyone thinks it's from the outside. They think it's like ninjas, but in reality, they're just unbelievably amazing at the basics and the fundamentals and they never screw the fundamentals up. Is, would you agree with that With that take who was told to me by a guy from that unit? 100%. Masters of the basics. Masters of the base. I'm a firm believer in acquiring fundamental and basic skills. You know, from, from, from the time as a kid, communicating, getting along with people, um, being basic fundamental and skills and uh the unit members uh i've never seen such exactness in the application of basic skills in my life i've never seen such exactness it was clockwork machines in action getting the job done on the combat field off the con in every aspect it was amazing to me it was amazing what's it like operating in a country that is essentially divided by five six however many different factions you know you got the united states you have the assad regime you have the russians who are in there you have iranian assets that are in there you got yeah. isis that's in there how the hell do you even know i mean how are, how do you know the russians aren't just going to try rolling through wherever you are um, well, they tried that once and it didn't work it, out. It, for, it, it, it didn't work correct. out well for them. Uh, I was there for that. Um, the, um, it, here's something that, uh, this will make some people mad, but I don't, the, the truth is the truth that I believe generals hide behind and, and to be honest with you, so do politicians. They hide behind this lie. Uh, whenever something, um, uh, they'll say, well, it's, it's really complicated. 
it's actually not that complicated. You know, I, ISIS was bad. The Kurds were good. Uh, the ISIS ISIS was on this side, uh, and we'll just you know keep keep killing everyone on that on on that side until we get to Raqqa and we free Raqqa. Um, Syria wasn't a problem. Um, Syria the the whole reason why ISIS was able to take over half of Syria is because the Syrian army was just inept, um, and they the Syrian army you know stayed over on the uh, on the on the western side and they weren't gonna. They didn't have the ability. They weren't going to go toe to toe with Americans, or, or, you know, they. I believe they were more than willing to let America rid their country of of the ISIS problem, and then they'll get their country back through political means because they know, you know, America's going to give it back to them anyway because we're always uh, politically spineless. Um, so that I believe that was their uh, their goal, which which basically worked out for him. Um, the Russians, the Russians were just there to do, you know, to, was just there to, to stir things up. But I, I, I never worried about the Russians, you know, uh, being a part of the problem, the different factions, a slight problem with the different factions. Cause who's a friend one day is an enemy the next, but that, that generally wasn't, uh, wasn't a problem because that, that really didn't happen within the Kurds. Um, and so as long as he just, you know, stayed with the Kurds, the Kurds were, the Kurds are really good partners. The Kurds were the best partners we've ever had. They were way better than the Afghans and way better than the Iraqis. Um, they were more than willing to fight for their cause. Uh, all they wanted was guns and ammo and, you know, point in the direction of the enemy. And they, and you know, they, they, as best they could go take care of the problem. Uh, I really respected the Kurds. That's great to hear, and I've only ever heard good things. I'm sure you can't get into details at all. I, I know exactly the engagement you're referring to with the Russians. Uh, you don't have to talk about I won't ask you to talk about it because you mentioned it. Do you ever sit back, and for anyone watching this, you can Google it. You'll find out about it in 10 seconds. Do you ever sit back and think to yourself, I can't believe I was a part of something in so many ways that was historic? Yeah, it It actually happened twice. Uh, I was I was a part of the of of the second uh, skirmish, and what'll hit the news big is is the first one. Gotcha, got gotcha. and 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 rightfully so. Um, and so yeah, you, the, the the first one was the 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 big news worth uh, worthy one. Yeah, just just go Google it. But um, again, uh, it, it's in the news. I'll talk about it a, a, a little bit. But I tell you what's yeah kind of crazy is getting you know being a small team. And getting uh, an intel brief about how to uh, about all the different Russian tanks and Syrian tanks that that are in the area uh, that was definitely a first. And going, what are we what are we doing? Like this, we're we're, I mean, we're not the team that goes up against uh, tanks. Although ironically enough, we've 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 taken out more than uh, I don't know, maybe more than anyone else. Uh, just just at a the the skirmishes that we've been in and the places we've been um that's not true uh invasion of iraq odas took out a lot of tanks through javelins but uh we've 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 had our fair share with uh with javelins and uh, it was definitely a, a, a crazy um a crazy brief and a crazy time you know you don't really think that you're going to go uh you know toe to toe with the russians you know so to speak but in syria syria was a wild time how did you personally handle being on a team that lost 50% of its, or had a 50% casualty rate? I mean, that must weigh on your mind and your heart, or is it a thing where you don't have time to think about it because you're just constantly going back out there? It's actually like a prideful thing. Like we want, we don't get to choose our wars. And every guy I guarantee, you, you know, wants something like World War II, like, I mean, once you get to where we got, we know what we can do. You know, I had nightmares of my own Delta troop coming against me when I got home because there ain't, you're not, there's no chance. When a troop hits a building, like you're, you're done. So, um, uh, where were we at? Just how you handle the trauma of losing that oh, many guys. It's a, it's like a prideful, I mean, we had it on the board. It's just like, okay, I mean, yeah, it hurts, but like, we got to go harder, you know? 
I came home, my daughter was born in 05. We were on a rotation. I came home for a month. It was awesome. You know, that Delta just loves their people. People are the most important thing. It's the best place in the world to work, we would always say. And I came home and, and you know, two of my buddies were killed while I was home. And then I come back and another one's killed. So you just go harder. Like that's, are we going to win or, or not? And yeah, it's a, it's a, like a pride thing. I think when you're, when your friends die and, and th th we're going to get into the very next thing we're going to talk about pepper, the, the second deployment, but you say you're going harder, but does it become more personal as well? Or is it always just strictly business? Because as a civilian, if someone killed my friends and I had the opportunity to kick in a door and I'm not trying to be a fake tough guy, I, I don't, I don't do any of that stuff, obviously. But if you killed my family members, if you killed my friend, like it'd become a personal thing to me. It wouldn't be business anymore. How did you process that? Just like you said, like, actually there was, a, there was a time where, you know, we, we had, we caught the, a recidivist. We had, we had captured some guys tried to put them through their legal system. You know, I remember once there was a ranger that got shot right above his plate right here. And we just got there and there's this huge puddle of blood and uh, the, the guys, you know, we found them and they're surrendering because they won't fight and they were laughing at us. And that's when I was like, man, <laughs> this has got to change. You know, hey boss, um, your, your intent, commander's intent says, kill or capture right yes okay in that order you know and i like to ask the question with usama bin laden they just they shot him you know there was no and and nobody disagrees with that right right so what is it if, if you kill three thousand people that's okay you know where, where's the line for for just going in to kill somebody it's tough freaking business and somebody said you know oh, anybody can kill a caveman well, how many cavemen have you killed sir because it's tough and it's not natural but f yeah man like you said when they when your friends get killed or a dog gets killed it's like it's unspoken i mean we just get back to our our building we eat we watch tv nobody you know nobody's talking and then we, when we go out again, it's just an unspoken thing. And yes, it's brutal. Well, you know, you, you did a, a great job explaining what it all was and kind of how it came to be. But there were uh, the, this box of patches that showed up and I was coming back from running our selection course right after September 11th. And I showed up and I saw this box and looked in the box and there are all these FDNY patches. And so you could see they still had like the blue threads from where they had cut them off of people's uniforms. And some of them had phrases, you know, die mother rotten hell, you know, hope you burn in hell. Some of them had names and, and I, I kind of got the gist of it was they want us to carry these forward. And, you know, whether it's like, I don't think we would throw stuff out like death cards, but I think that was kind of in their idea of, so somebody somewhere knew somebody where I was and they made this thing happen, but just kind of anonymously, I've never been able to get to the bottom of, you know, who sent it and, and all of that. So I had this patch with me always like breast pocket, carried it around, had it on my, you know, where all my personal items and stuff like that was always sitting there. And, you know, it got to go be a part of a lot of historic stuff. And when there were some unique circumstances that happened where uh, my patch had a name on the back. And in 2005, September 11th, they had family members reading, family members of those that were killed, reading the names of those who had, had passed away. And I'm on my treadmill at home and running and I see this beautiful blonde woman and she says the name that was on the patch that I had. And I was like, wow, that is crazy. Um, and that was what started kind of the quest of like, well, who was this guy? I didn't know that he was necessarily a person that was killed, 
Maybe it was just a fireman that wanted his name, you know, to be carried forward, whatever it might be. So anyway, I did some research, found out where he was stationed, read about him. And as I was reading about him, it was almost as if I was reading about myself. And, you know, dude loved to wear flannel and he was always the life of the party and liked to have a good time, loved animals, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I felt like, man, I need to do something with this. I, I can't go be public, uh, you know, like let's have a news crew there and hey, here I am. I'm an active member of an organization and, you know, don't want to talk about that. So I asked a buddy of mine who was in New York, you know, hey, the next time I'm up, whenever that is, can we go by this place? And, you know, I just want to drop this off super low key, be in and out and, you know, they can do with it whatever they want. They can give it to his family they can, you know, any of that stuff. So it, it kind of things tr transpired from there. Um, but anyway, that's, that's kind of how it went. So I thought, okay, I don't want to just take this back and be like, Hey, I'm returning this patch. Uh, I've got to do something with it. And just putting it in a frame by itself didn't seem appropriate. So I took uh, one of the assault flags off of my assault vest and put it in there. And then I thought, okay, I went and took it to somebody who could do that. And they were like, what about a coin? What if we put a challenge coin? And I was like, yeah, I'll get a unit coin and put that in there too. And that's what I did. So it's just this beautiful, very powerful, you know, both sides represented. My real intent in returning the patch to the firehouse was to let the firemen know, like my brothers are over there right now, shellacking dudes because of what happened September 11th. So this was at a time when politically, you know, it was, why are we there? Oh, this is like an oil thing. You know, someone's politically got an agenda that, well, wait, we all voted for going to war over there. And, and now all of a sudden we're questioning it when it starts to have a human toll. And so the news was every day, you know, three more guys were killed today and questioning why we were there and all of that. And I wanted the firemen to know that we got your back because of what happened. We haven't forgotten. Doesn't matter if everybody else in America forgot, we didn't forget and we got you. Wow. I, that is, I'm speechless that you, I could clip that and spread it. And that, that doesn't make you proud to be an American. I don't know what will, did they say anything specifically to you uh, when you presented it to them? Well, uh, that kind of turned into a whole other thing. Like the guy that took me over there, the night before he starts telling me like, Hey, we're going to go, we're going to go there tomorrow. Like, okay, cool. Um, we're going to go at 10 AM because all the guys coming in on the morning shift will be there and everybody leaving from the night shift will be there. So it'll be a full house. And I'm like, dude, I don't want to do this. Yeah. Like, I don't want to be up there, you know, speaking in front of a group of people. Like I have nothing prepared. This isn't what I wanted to do. Uh, and, and anyway, it kind of transpired to like, well, the family is going to be there too. And I'm like, dude, you were putting so much pressure on me. Like, I don't, want, I don't want to do this. So anyway, that was, that was kind of how it rolled out. So at some point, you know, I was being as benign as I could possibly be, you know, Hey, here's this thing, you know, uh, there was a whole lot of explaining about like, is this guy in the army? You know, what, what is this guy? Like nobody really understood uh, I can I can say that, you know, after what I told them that, you know, I don't think there were too many dry eyes in the firehouse. So it was a powerful life moment. How, the dog did, engages. how did you personally handle being on a team that lost 50 percent of its or had a 50 percent casualty rate? I mean, that must weigh on your mind and your heart. Or is it a thing where you don't have time to think about it because you're just constantly going back out there? It's actually like a prideful thing. Like we want, we don't get to choose our wars. And every guy I guarantee, you know, wants something like World War II. Like, I mean, once you get to where we got, we know what we can do. You know, I had nightmares of my own Delta troop coming against me when I got home because there ain't, you're not, there's no chance. When a troop hits a building, like you're you're done. It's a, it's like a prideful. I mean, we hit it on the board. It's just like, okay. I mean, yeah, it hurts, but like, 
we got to go harder. You know, I came home. My daughter was born in 05. We were on a rotation. I came home for a month. It was awesome. You know, that Delta just loves their people. People are the most important thing. It's the best place in the world to work. We would always say, and I came home and, and, you know, two of my buddies were killed while I was home. And then I come back and another one's killed. So you just go harder. Like that's, are we going to win or, or not? And yeah, it's a, it's a, like a pride thing. I think. Does it feel better killing someone like that compared to maybe, you know, uh, a regime loyalist or, or maybe I hear a lot of guys talk about some of the guys they fought in Afghanistan. They almost, I wouldn't say feel bad for them, but they're like, is this guy purely evil? Maybe, maybe not. But they all say when it came to ISIS, it just felt better. Did, would you agree with that? I, I would. I mean, the, the way I would rate it, uh, if you will, and, and everyone will have a different, you know, experience and a different answer. Um, you know, in, in Iraq, sometimes we were in the middle of, you know, of, of a civil war, you know, at some point, you know, that at the um, uh, Afghanistan, I, I respected uh, the guys in Afghanistan. They, you know, they always come out to fight, you know, they're at least willing to die for their cause. Um, uh, but man, I, I really, really, really hated ISIS. I, I never walked by a dead ISIS body with anything other than just joy. Were those I, know that guys, so, I know that sounds weird, but I'm just, no, no, it doesn't I'm sound just, we, no, it doesn't sound weird at all. Yeah. Where the, you know, ISIS presented it and I, and I, I am enjoying this a lot. I think our viewers are going to be fascinated by this, especially the younger ones. ISIS is, they projected, you know, we're so tough. We're so violent. We're, we're, we're we, you can't reach the level that we get to. When you, if you captured any of these guys, did they drop the tough guy act pretty quickly or did they try to maintain that in custody? Uh, you got, you got, a, you had a, um, a good mix of, uh, like some of the foreign fighters that would come through that they were, they were tenacious, you know, and they'd look at you like, man, if, if you'd take these flex cuffs off me, I'd, you know, I'd choke the life out of you right now. I mean, they just stare at you with dead eyes. Uh, and, but, uh, yeah, you, you, you get a, you get a mixture of, of everything. And there, there are plenty of ISIS fighters on the front lines, you know, especially when the, you know, the, the March to Raqqa was going on that they didn't want to be, they didn't want to be on the front lines, but it was either stay on the front lines and fight or, um, you know, or retreat and get killed by ISIS. And you could still say, well, you know, you still enjoyed watching them die, you know, cause they, you know. Yeah, like they they wrote they they raised their hand to come to come fight for evil, and then they found out what evil was, and so you already voted, uh, you came to do this, and now you know be careful what you wish for. I, I had someone tell me, uh, you know, outside of an interview that uh, Dev Grew is more fun, but the unit is where the real hitters are at. <laughs> but everyone's turned on at all times, and that can be very, very stressful because there's no down moments. There's no mistakes tolerated. Was that your experience that there was very little room for air when you're in the Army's SMU? Um, well, I think in, in both places, you know, with, with Dev Group and us, you know, there was – everybody was there for a reason. Everybody wanted to, to excel and to be in the top spot. You know, granted, we always make fun of each other. I mean, it's the – you know, uh, the fighting with the stepbrother type thing, right. you know, right. but, um, I think on both sides equally, you know, guys wanted to do the job and do everything. They had a better place to live. Definitely Virginia beach over Fayetteville. <laughs> um, so, but I think also, yeah, they were a little bit more lax in a different way, not in a bad way, but then, um, you know, we had still the camaraderie, everything else. A lot of guys were, you know, Rangers. So they grew up under that Rogers aren't Rogers aren't. I mean, and then you had the SF guys that, but, we all kind of knew what was what, and we knew what the job was, and we focused on on that. But we still had a great time, and I think it was uh, it was a true family, you know. I mean, because like before we deploy, we'd all the whole squadron get together, things like that, with the families, and you know, we yeah, a lot of parties along the way, in and around. But um, 
you know, you guys got a lot of strong will guys and everybody's there. It's like being in the NFL. <laughs> that's a, no, that's a, I, you're not the first person to ever uh, make that comparison. I think it's a, it's a very fair and it's an easy one for the audience to understand. But on that note, guys get cut from NFL teams. Mm -hmm. They get cut because they're not performing. They get cut maybe because they're a cancer in the locker room. Is that the same thing when you're talking about dealing with the tip of the spear level units where if a guy just doesn't mesh, is it like, hey, you might have gotten here through selection. You might have gone, gone through the OTC and maybe you've even deployed with us, but this is not a good fit. What do you do when a guy just does not belong ultimately? Um, that, that has happened and it's sad. It's just, but it is just, the way it goes and especially when you're then at that level and, and that time you know doing combat continuous combat operations um but you know you got to counsel guys you know that, that's it's not like corporate america where all of a sudden you just get hijacked and hr's on the phone and oh you're fired you know the the military still has a little bit of a way that you know you still have to get some counseling granted if something is really severe that decision can be made at that point because of the fact we know i can't trust this person in combat um but you know you try to mentor guys get them in the right way but then some guys just it it's just not for them you know they may succeed back in the range range regiment you know but not there at the unit because it's a little different as far as you know a little bit freer when we say about having that uh relaxed standards when it comes to the really you know yes sir no sir and so forth you know everybody's a first name basis really so uh some guys just can't deal with some of that stuff and then um when you look at excuse me selection you know, that tests a lot of things as an individual. Um, and some guys just can't do that. So a lot of guys get washed out in selection because they just, they, they need somebody to tell them how well they're doing, how, you know, Hey, you only have, uh, have this much left to go. So, Hey, good job, buddy. And stuff like that. And, it, you know, really it's just, don't be late, light or out of uniform. And what we used to also kind of say is it's, it's, uh, it's harder to stay in the unit than it is to get there. I've heard other people say that too. Yep. That, that's crazy. But I mean, I, you know, it's, it's tough for the viewers and me to understand that because we're not there, right? Like we don't understand the standard that you and your old teammates are held to. Got you. So I want to, I want to jump now to 2001, September 11, 2001. I was in fourth grade for a lot of people watching this show are very young. Some of them weren't even alive when 9-11 happened. Do you remember specifically where you were when the towers were hit? Yeah, I was, um, we were uh, in Stansted, England, an Air Force base, a, a British Air Force base. Um, I was in BCO 175. I was now Staff Sergeant. And we were there with um, with A Squadron, and we were doing kind of a show of force rehearsal missions. At the time, there was an election in Montenegro that wasn't going well. Uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't have all the details, but we were doing like these rehearsal missions in case something would happen, uh, you know, in the Balkans type thing. Um, I remember we went out and we're doing this reversal, came back and uh, Ace Wire was gone. And like, we had no idea what was going on. I remember there's like a, we didn't have any access to TV or really anything. Um, you know, probably someone in our company, chain of command knew something. I just remember like the next morning. So they're eight hours ahead. Uh, so, you know, we, at some point we went to whatever the next meal was, I don't remember. And there's like this little 13 inch TV in, in that, that little restaurant. And we remember, remember seeing replays of it. And that's when we found out what happened. Um, the, uh, and I remember we couldn't, we had to guard that base because we didn't know what was going on and we couldn't get an aircraft home. You know, all the military aircraft was kind of grounded or used for other things. We could get civilian aircraft. Uh, so we were basically issued live ammo and told to guard this base. Eventually, we went home as 3rd Ranger Battalion was uh, passing. They kind of passed us in the air with uh, elements of B Squad, all B Squadron, elements of A Squadron to go to Objective uh, Rhino, Objective Gecko. So we got back home, and you know that was kind of. Yeah, uh, where I was when when nine eleven. And, and were guys that you were around when nine eleven happened? Was the feeling like just find us some targets? Like, did you instantly want to get in the fight, or was there just so much chaos you didn't really have time to think about that? Uh, yes and no. I mean, it was it was a lot of a lot of chaos and just lack of information. 
Um, you know, at the time we didn't have a lot of, not, not just wherever we were, but there just was a lot of internet access period. Um, which seems crazy. We didn't have smartphones. We didn't have you know, any of that stuff. Um, so yeah, so that, that mainly came later, um, when, uh, when we started going into Afghanistan, um, guy Roberts Ridge happened and some other things happened. And basically my company, you know, just because of the rotation and cycle, it wasn't anything, you know, malicious or anything. We just never had the opportunity to go initially. Um, when it, on our battalion's turn, where there was like a, an RF one company, I think that was like, if you were the battalion on call, then there's a company on double secret probation type thing. Yeah. And they got to go. Um, so ACO went, uh, when Roberts Ridge happened. Um, and after that, I was like, look, I'm, I'm not getting in the fight. So I had a bunch of friends that had gone to selection and they were kind of the guys, not just friends, but, um, you know, mentors and stuff and people that you're like, yeah, that guy is going to make it. And, he, and they would, um, and we had, had one, one of my friends went, never trained up or into anything. And he came back, like, did you make it? He's like, yeah. I'm like, holy crap, if that guy made it, and nothing against him, but you know, he made it, it's possible for all of us. And it was kind of like a mass exodus. And you know, like, how often are you actually having to pull the trigger on a target? As a Green Beret, the, the, just the truth is not not much. You know, uh, you get into a lot of firefights at distance. Um, you know, you, you call it in CAS. You know, you, you, don't, you don't get close and personal with the enemy uh like like i did a lot more often at the unit there were definitely times you know there's that's just always a it's a risky job so it's it's always it could happen at at, at any moment and randomly it would but uh you know it's hard to put a percentage on it but most missions were you know were were easy missions you know most missions you know not you know not a not a shot was fired at all. You know, not without a doubt. Not everybody died on every on every target. Um, and yeah, you know, when you really talk about um, my SF days in Iraq, yeah, you know, and, and even and every theater is different. You know, the, the guys came to fight in Afghanistan way more than they came to fight in Iraq with the target sets that we were going after. Almost every target set in Iraq, even though we knew the intel was good, it was our intel. Like we, we were, we were certain and we had the, we had the, the, the intelligence and the dual sourced reports, not just from one guy, but from several people saying, you know, this is a bad guy. And these are all the things he did. And, uh, you know, we'd hit his house in the middle of the night and either, you know, pull him out of his bedroom while he's hiding, uh, or, you know, or he's still asleep by the time you get to his room, you know, that you got the, the target set for us in Iraq was a lot of people giving up, um, I really think they'd rather uh, fight it out in the court system than with the Americans, knowing that they'll they'll win and they'll get out eventually because we went after a lot of you know, fancy word, but you know, recidivists, which are you know prior you know prior offenders. But but in Afghanistan, they were way more willing to to take shots at you coming in. Abs- absolutely, and now and and I'm not saying that they're willing to fight it out toe to toe with you. But, you know, they, they love taking pop shots at you. They love, you know, they love shooting at you from, from the mountainside and at a distance. In Afghanistan, if you stay in one place long enough, they, they, they are, they are going to come say hi to you uh, for sure. Which just generally speaking, what wasn't the case in, in Iraq. I, I want to ask now, so I got I to gotta buffer this a little bit again. A few years ago, I was on a bachelor party. And we were discussing Delta Four, SEAL Team Six, the unit, all that good stuff. And someone told me, he's like, I, I know for a fact, this is what this guy said, I know for a fact, only Army guys are allowed in Delta Force. Only Army guys. And yet here I am currently right now sitting with a man from the Marine Corps who went to the unit. So can you explain how that how that occurs? How do you go from being an officer in the Marines to, to joining the unit in Fort Bragg? Yeah, well, the process, uh, I, I was in, in the military at a, at a time when organizations were opening up 
they were they were understanding diversity and the importance of diversifying their organizations and units with different minded people. And um, I'm all about a diversified workforce, by the way. I, I think that's very important with regards to mindsets and skill sets and even performance. And, and uh, the, the Army opened up one of their specialized units, opened it up to other branches, Marine Corps being one. I heard about it. And uh, there were so many billets available. And I, I heard about it. I, I submitted my paperwork. And uh, yeah, and then I took the interview process and then assessment and selection. So I got I to gotta ask, I got to know, when you're a Marine and now you join the Army's SMU, what level of hazing goes on when you come from a different branch? Or is there no hazing at all? I, David, it's such... A different level. It's it's indescribable. Even to this day, I I was privileged, honored, and blessed to serve at that organization, and it was nothing but professional warriors, professionals at all levels, and when you're operating operating at that level, there's no time for there's no time. There's no time except for work and getting the mission done. And the time I was there, it was spent working, getting the mission done. And, you know, the hate, yeah, there's some, <laughs> yeah, there's some clown ops, I guess. I call them clown ops. You know, oh, here's the crayon eater. You know, Marines are known as crayon eaters. <laughs> you know, but, uh, you know, it's all tongue in cheek and it's fun. And, uh, yeah, we have some fun moments, but there's, mutual high mutual respect for everyone there because we all go through that rite of passage through that selection through that assessment selection process onward to the training course and every day you're there every second every minute of every hour is a rite of passage <laughs> there's no time to get complacent at the unit i kind of respect people who 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 fight and who don't they get the ones that are just like you know they they actually do grab kids or women a lot and hide behind them and you just shoot them it's not like the movie's like oh my gosh they've got it you just shoot them in the freaking head that's why we train so much man right like the movies need to catch up they've gotten better but like there's that doesn't happen <laughs> like, dude you're giving me your whole nugget there i'm gonna just your brain's coming out of your head in about it half a second okay what the reason i'm here and doing this and able to do this and and will boldly tell any story and have guys back me up i'm not going to embellish anything um i did hundreds and hundreds of hits i have them all recorded killed many people and will never regret that it's it's the best feeling the most indescribable feeling to do your job what you trained to do go in there crush them I mean, it's like, ugh, it's like winning a, a football game <laughs> or winning a football game is like that, but it's indescribable to do your job, you know, and come in and they, and they grab a kid and you just poke a hole in their head. Like the best sniper shot I ever took was two meters, two meters away. This I never took a long, sexy shot. I was a sniper for a while, but this guy grabbed his wife and was rolling, using her for protection and I'm moving and I didn't think about it, which is why it, it was perfect. I just shot him and his brain came out in his wife's lap. It was the weirdest thing in the world. What, what do you think about, what do you think it says about a man that would hide behind his wife? It's a culture that, um, that is different. Now, I want to I want to touch on the fundamentalist, the jihadi, the jihadi aspect of what you've seen or your teammates had seen a lot of young people. I was in college when, when, you know, Iraq was kind of at the end, ISIS was starting to be a big thing. And I often heard, I use this example all the time, people would make excuses for some of the, the savagery that displayed the beheadings, 
the rapes, the mutilations, things like that is, you know, they're just misunderstood. Where we deserve a lot of the blame, their words, not mine. In your experience, as someone who's fought Saddam's uniformed soldiers and then fought people that engaged in that level of savagery, how do you mentally view it? Is it different to you or does it make no difference whether you're just a regular uniformed soldier compared to an ideological suicide bomb? I mean, personally, it, it made no difference to me. Um, we obviously changed our tactics uh, significantly. And I, you know, without getting into any kind of, you know, special tactics that were used, I mean, if someone's just going to blow themselves up, I mean, it, let's, let's take it from like a hostage rescue and then a uniformed uh, military and then a, an ununiformed military. And if it's a hostage rescue, which was our primary mission, you know, my job is to put myself between the hostage and the hostage taker, whatever that means. Um, if it's a uniform, if it's uniform military, you know, you can kind of bank on that they're using some sort of military doctrine. Um, you can segregate them from the populace. Uh, you know, just they, they look different, they act different, they have you know different equipment. And then if you have you know an insurgency that kind of just blends in everywhere and are willing to kill themselves just to disrupt how you're doing things, we're doing things which is kind of terror, true terror then, you know, we're going to change our tack because I don't want to be anywhere near that. So one end of the spectrum you have potentially when you're putting myself in front of a hostage to, I don't want to be anywhere near, like, why are we even going on target? And I'm not saying that I didn't want to go on target, but can we just bomb this house? And, right. you know, and, and that whole thing changed uh, over time of what acceptable collateral damage was. And I'm not saying it, what the limit should be or shouldn't be, but, um, you know, it, it definitely changed over time to, you know, are, are we willing to to sacrifice, uh, you know, ourselves as opposed to just standing off and either standing off the target by hundreds of meters or hundreds of miles and, and conducting the same mission.